Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Mysteries Geometry Podcast. This is, I believe, going to be the third episode of the 2009-2010 school year. We're still on logic, but now we're going to talk about logic proofs. As always, please remember you can get the PDF of this pre- this podcast at my website, mandrakovics.eboard.com. Just pause the video there for a second, you can grab that off the screen, go to Geometry, go to Geometry Podcast, and you can get the PDF. Okay, so let's get started with Geometry Proof. Excuse me? Logic Proof. There are essentially three laws you need to know. There are some other ones, but for the most part, these will get you through. The law of detachment, law of monotonous, and law of disjunctive inference. These are just formal ways of saying things that should make sense to you if you think them through. Here's what the law of detachment says. If you know that this conditional statement is true, if you have P, then you have Q. So if it rains, then my shoes get wet. And you find out that you do have P. In other words, it does rain. Well, there's a very simple conclusion to be made here. If it rains, then my shoes get wet. It does rain, therefore, my shoes get wet. We can conclude Q. If the hypothesis is true, the conclusion must be. And we just call that the law of detachment. So when we're doing a proof, we say law of detachment is a reason, so people know what we're talking about. Law of Morris Collins. Well, if you're in my class, you know that I love this one. Modus Tollens, if you'll bear with me, the internet. This is short for Modus Tolendo Tollens. That's Latin for the way that denies by denying. Sounds a little cryptic. Let me show you what it is, and we'll see that this actually is a good way to define it. Modus Tollens says this. Let's say you have the same conditional statement, if P, then Q. So if it rains, then my shoes get wet. But this time what you find out is that, in fact, your shoes aren't wet. In other words, the conclusion is false. So we find out my shoes aren't wet. There's a conclusion to be made here. If it rains, my shoes get wet. Shoes aren't wet. So could it have rained? It's not possible, right? Why? Because if it did rain, my shoes would be wet, and they're not. So we can say, look, therefore it must not have rained. We can deny the hypothesis. So modus tolendo tollens, the way that denies by denying, it denies the conclusion, excuse me, denies the hypothesis by denying the conclusion. So it actually makes a lot of sense. That's uh, one of my favorites. Last one we're going to talk about today is law of disjunctive inference. This one, again, is straightforward. It should make sense if you think about it. It says the following. If you know that you have P or Q, and it turns out you don't have P, then there's something to be said. Think about it. I'm going to go to the movies, or I'm going to go to dinner. And then you find out, I'm not going to the movies. So what am I left with? Dinner. Must go to dinner, right? Assuming I was telling the truth. And I always do. So if this is a true statement, and you don't have P, you can conclude you must have, whoops, must have Q. Disjunctive inference works the other way too. If you know P or Q, and you find out you don't have Q, then in the very same manner, you can conclude, since you don't have Q, you must have P. Okay? So, when we're doing logic proofs, we're really just using these three laws. There's a couple others, but they don't come up as much. One of the ones that you may use sometimes, and uh, we may use it tonight, is called the Morgan's Law. If it comes up, I'll show that to you. But I think we can get by with these three. So let's try a proof. Again, you can get the PDF of this. In a logic proof, what we're trying to do is make small steps. And each time that you make small steps, you back it up with a reason. One of those three we just talked about, in general. So you're going to look at your givens. We're trying to get a way down to the proof. One of these givens should be obvious that you're going to use it in the beginning. Can you tell which one? Hopefully you're looking at this H here. This is a good candidate to start with. Why? It's all alone. It's just telling you something. So use that information. So what you're going to do is look for who can you pair H up with. Which of these four is going to allow you to make a conclusion when you put it together with that H? Have you decided on one? Hopefully you're looking at the very first one. If you have G, then you don't have H, right? G, our, not H. This right here is going to be pretty useful. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, if you have G, then you don't have H, and we're going to take this H, and we're going to put these into our proof. We're going to use the two of those to make a conclusion. 
So this is our first step. We're going to say step one, look, you told me these things were true, I'm going to use them right now. My reason is given. Right? I don't have to back that one up. It was given to me. But now, I'm going to take that and put it together to get some new piece of information. So you tell me, if you have G, then you have H, right? You have, excuse me, if you have G, then you don't have H. But you do have H. So what must be true? can't have G, can you? Right? Think about it in words. If you study, then you won't get grounded. You got grounded. Right? If you study, then you don't get grounded. You get grounded. That must mean you didn't study. Right? So in step two, I'm going to make a conclusion based on those two pieces of information. And I'm going to conclude that G didn't happen. I don't have G. Why? Because of modus tollens. I'm denying by denying my hypothesis. My hypothesis was that H wouldn't happen. H did happen. It was denied. So my reason here is modus tollens. And it's a good practice to always tell me what step it is you're working with. So here I'm just using step one nice and simple. Okay. And I'll go ahead and check this one off since I'm only going to use each given once. I have three to choose from now. Now what I want to do is look to take my new piece of information, not G, and pair that up with something in my givens so I can get a new conclusion. So what do you see here? I mean, which of these three looks good to you? Well, only one of them even has a G, so that's probably a good direction to go, right? Not F, arrow, G. I'm going to take this one next. Not F, arrow, G. I'm going to bring this guy right down into my proof here. And I'm going to use this to make another conclusion. Now, this I don't have to back up, right? This is just step three. It's given. I don't have to provide a reason. But the next step, I'm going to bring some information, right? We're going to conclude something here. So, if you look at steps two and three, if you have F, excuse me, if you don't have F, then you have G, right? Not F, our G. But you don't have G. Well, hopefully you're seeing another modus tollens here, right? This says that if you don't have F, you have G. So if you don't fail, then you get good grades, right? If you don't fail, you get good grades. But we already know that you didn't, right? Not, not G is true. We don't have G. So if we don't have G, that means we must have F. This is, again, modus tollens here. If we didn't have F, then we have G. Since we don't have G, we must have the opposite of the hypothesis. So we can conclude F. Why? Modus tollens again. The way that denies by denying. This time, though, I'm going to be using modus tollens on steps two and three, so I'll write that in my proof. Okay? So now we know that F is true. What can we do with that? Well, look from there back to our givens. We have two givens left, not F or J, and J, arrow K. Which one can we put together with F to get a conclusion? Well, again, only one of them even has an F in it, so it's a pretty easy choice, right? We've got to use this one here. If I take not F or J, I can do something. So, I'm going to grab this, bring it into my proof. Step five, this is a given. What can I conclude? This says I have not F or J. In other words, there's a choice here. You don't have F or you have J. Right? One of those is going to be true. I have F. Well, if I have F, is it true not F? No, only one of those can be true, right? So if F is true, then not F doesn't happen. So my not F or J, not F goes away, I'm left with J. So I can conclude from here in step six that J must be true. We haven't used this reason yet in the proof. What's this reason? If we have this or this, one of them we don't, so we're left with the other. That's disjunctive inference, right? If I flip backward, disjunctive inference is the one, you have one thing or the other, one of them goes away, so you're left with the other. So here we're going to claim J by reason of disjunctive inference. This is with steps four and five. And we are almost done. 
There's only one given left. So I guess that's going to be the one. If you have J, then you have K. So let's bring it out. Step seven, if you have J, then you have K. Oh, I forgot to do my cool grab thing. Well, that's all right. So that's a given. If I have J, then I have K. And this one's kind of a hand, it's like a layup, right? This is a lob. If you have J, then you have K. You do have J. So what can we say? We've got K, right? Step seven, well, excuse me, step eight now, I can conclude K by detachment I'm using step six and seven to do that, right? Step six and step seven. Now, if you download the PDF, this won't bother you, but if you're looking carefully, you'll notice that says T. That's because when I cut and pasted this, apparently I didn't take the proof with me. So we're looking to prove K here.